in the mesozooplankton. Um, they are um, they range from anywhere between 0.2 and 20 millimeters. Uh, they're the ones circled in the green there. Um, and they actually play a pretty important role in the Antarctic food web. Um, they feed on the uh, phytoplankton and the microzooplankton, and then um, they pass on that energy to the higher trophic levels, so like the krill and um, larger organisms. And they also, uh, using their fecal pellets um, help with the um, cycling of carbon through the water cycle. Uh, the copepods that I focus on for my research is the Calanoides acutus and the Calanus propincus. Um, and the area that I focus on is the Western Antarctic Peninsula in the uh, square. Uh, it's one of the fastest rapidly warming regions um, in the world. And it's also an area that has uh, very high productivity. So it's been subject to a lot of uh, long-term climate change research and trying to see uh, the effects that climate change has on um, like the polar region. And so uh, the purpose of my project was to examine the spatial variation in zooplankton, in the zooplankton community structure and copepod physiology. Um, it's actually a part of a larger study that my mentor is doing on copepod physiology um, and the two species that the two species of copepods that the research is on, um, they store lipids. Um, the acutus uh, stores its lipids in wax esters, while the propincus stores its lipids in triglycerides. And um, acutus is more of a herbivore, and it goes through this dormant stage called a uh, diapause, where it uh, lowers its um, activity and just sort of lays dormant um, in like the colder temperatures or when food availability is low. Um, while propincus can go through diapause, it does not always go through it. And um, it also has more of a opportunistic omnivore uh, feeding habit. And so um, it's gonna, the larger project is looking into the gene expression um, that these copepods uh, do um, during like diapods to see if they maybe have similar uh, pathways. And it also looks at the overall effects of climate change in this area um, because of the varying time of sea ice retreat um, changed by the uh, warming temperatures and also how that may affect food availability and the long-term food web dynamics. And so to collect this data um, in 2019, uh, my mentor went on the RV Lawrence and Gold. Uh, the top left is a picture on the ship and then the right is um, what the ship looks like. Um, and so during the Palmer Long-Term Ecological Research Study, uh, they used these nets um, to collect samples. So at the bottom of this net is um, a collection bottle and they put it at different depths and to collect the uh, zooplankton. And so uh, they would take the copepods out of those collection samples and do some onboard testing and also uh, took some pictures, which is the pictures that I analyzed for my data. And then the bottom right picture is, a, um, is one of the onboard tests that my mentor and Dan was doing. And so this slide is showing the um, LTER study region. So this is um, the sites that they sampled. And then in yellow are the sites that we got our photos from. Um, and then it's also separated from north, south, and far south. And so with that data that was collected, um, the, we did a community analysis. So we took the zooplankton community composition data from the LTR and we put it into N, MDS plots and R to see if there were any um, strong clustering or similarities between these sites. Um, we saw very minimal clustering. Uh, we saw like a little bit of clustering of like the uh, like the sites um, as like north, south, and far south, but we didn't see any strong correlations between them. Um, and also, the triangles are the sites that we got our photos from. And so we also wanted to do the same thing uh, with just the uh, environmental variables to see if maybe 
the uh oh sorry to maybe see if the um sites had similarities um from that and again we didn't really see any strong clustering when we looked at like the chlorophyll the temperature and the salinity at each of these sites And so uh, using that data, we also wanted to plot out the abundance of the copepods to see where they uh, were, where we saw more of them um, in each of those areas. And we did notice that they were most abundant at the southern um, inshore sites that we had uh, samples from. And so we wanted to maybe see if there was any sort of correlation between those sites and the other zooplankton uh, that were collected in their abundance. And when we did that, we saw a positive correlation with the decapods, the pseudocegeta and the telios. And then we saw a negative correlation with the south aggregate, the finophores and tomopteris. And uh, the lower graphs are just showing the abundance. And then that top uh, right is the correlation plot that we did. And so when we put the abundance data back onto the map, um, we saw that they were most abundant when we went more inshore uh, for the copepods. And then out of the sites that we had pictures from, uh, the ones in green are where we saw really high abundance from the um, data that we had. And so with those pictures, uh, we wanted to run a photo analysis. And so to do that, we took um, the images and we grouped them by their species and orientation. And because uh, they had photos that were either lateral or dorsal. And then we looked at those photos and wanted to analyze if there was any food in their gut, um, which is like this green uh, that you see in the um, picture on the left. And then we also wanted to see what stage of reproduction they were in. And to do that, we looked at how well developed their eggs were. And eggs are a bit harder to see, but they're like a, um, those circular structures that are kind of clear. Um, and then, so I did my scores of the photos um, on my own and my mentor did uh, scores of the same photos. And then we came together and combined the scores and then decided uh, on any scores that we didn't have similarity for to sort of lessen the possibility of um, subjectiveness. And then we took those scores and plotted it into R to make plots of them. And then this is an example of uh, how we plotted those scores out. There we go. And then so when we did the food and gut, uh, we did note that the Calanoides acutus um, was highest at 200 and 204. And uh, those two sites are inshore. So this box is um, covering all of the inshore sites that we had data from. And so we saw that it was highest at these two inshore sites. While Calanoides potinkus had food and gut at all of the sites, it was a bit more even. Um, and then that's the insurance site that we had for them, but we didn't really see any strong distinctive pattern. And then for the reproduction results um, at those insure sites, we did see that Calinoides acutus had the highest maturity uh, within those sites, while Calinus patinkus um, had maturity that was more evenly distributed like the food and gut, but we did see that it was highest at our northernmost insure site. And so uh, when, once we did the community composition um, analysis, we saw that there was not really any strong clustering within each of the sites, even when we looked at the environmental variables. Uh, but this also is just a snapshot of the physical environment at the time that the data was collected. Um, we don't have um, data across multiple years. It was just the one year that we did sample that data. Um, so it may possibly be um, a lag so like something could have happened, some sort of event could have happened the year prior that affected the year that we did sample. For the copepods, we did overall see a high abundance at the inshore sites, um, and we saw positive correlation with the decapods and a negative correlation with the south aggregate. Um, but to get a better idea of this community composition, uh, we think that it would be 
a good idea to do some long-term environmental data like the LPR program is doing um, that to give us a better idea of the community of these copepods over time and see if like possibly there was um, sort of a, a lag effect that happened um, for the year prior or if there's maybe a certain event that made the composition the way that it was. Um, also, if we did a species level copepod abundance, we think that that would be um, helpful as well because the data that we have is just overall copepods that were collected and not species specific. So um, Calinoides acutus actually is out of the copepods, the more dominant of the two species, um, but we are not sure of how much the acutus made up um, compared to the copincus. So we think that that would be helpful to learn that. Uh, for the copepods, um, the two species, acutus had higher proportions of food and gut um, at inshore sites and also high egg development inshore, while propincus was a more even distribution for both food and gut and egg development. We did see it a bit higher towards inshore for egg development for propincus. Um, so overall, we uh, said that the calendaris acutus was more variable to the environment compared to Propincus um, and was in better condition inshore, which could be uh, because of their, um, the, their eating habits because Acutus is more of an herbivore. So it does, um, it could be doing better because inshore the temperature is a bit higher. There's more chlorophyll that um, we saw uh, higher levels of chlorophyll in those areas compared to Propincus that's more opportunistic. So it could just be evenly distributed because it's not as dependent uh, when it comes to what it is eating um, at these different sites. And so the broader implications that um, we could, that we made off of this uh, results that we got uh, was just like more of an insight into the short-term adaptation changes that um, these copepods do. And also uh, we know that this is helpful for just long-term monitoring of these uh, communities in general, because LTR uh, doesn't go as in depth with each of the specific uh, zooplankton that they collect. So this is um, helpful to get a better idea of the effects of climate change on these uh, vulnerable regions. And these are my references. And before I go on to talk about my uh, SPS collaboration, was there any questions? Okay. Is there any? Oh, okay. No questions in the chat. Let's do it again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I think we're good. Are there any questions in the audience here? Whoops. All right, Adrian, I do not see any questions in the chat either. So you can oh, okay. So keep going. Um, so also during the summer, I did a collaboration with the Falmouth Public Schools. Um, I worked with two eighth grade science teachers, uh, Abigail Smith and Carmela Mayeski, and they are from the Lawrence School. And so for our project, we thought it would be a good idea to do a web page. So this is a screenshot of the web page itself. Um, and so uh, when you go to the web page, there is um, just like information about like PEP and how this collaboration came to be. And then there's an about us section. So you get to learn a little bit more about what I did specifically for my research this summer. And also uh, to learn about the teachers that I worked with. And we added a teacher resources section. And so there are different links. So we have uh, different activities um, that I'm going to talk about in a minute. And uh, also we have uh, resources and links that we use to put all of this information together. Uh, we thought it would be a good idea so that if uh, any other teachers may want to incorporate some of this into their own lesson plans, it would be easier to access. And also if you have a course that's online, 
um, or if you have to do online teaching, it would be easier for the students to get access to it as well. So uh, one of the activities that we have is a coloring page. Um, we thought that it would be fun, a fun way to get the students to learn about what copepods are, since they are so small, it's kind of hard to conceptualize what we're talking about. Because when you think of Antarctica, you don't really exactly think of copepods, you kind of think of, you know, penguins and polar bears and stuff like that. So we thought it would be fun to do a coloring page to give them an idea of what they look like. And also, uh, you could use this as a way to talk about the different parts of these copepods. Um, and then we have a background information section where you can read about just like um, climate change, uh, the Antarctic food web, and learn more about like what these copepods do um, and like why they're why it's so important that we get more information about this um, community. And then there is a vocabulary section that highlights these important words that uh, you try to get the students to remember and like sort of understand. And then using those vocabulary words, uh, we have a guided reading section. So then you can do a like a fill in the blank activity um, as a way to like sort of retain all of that information to, you know, trying to get the students to remember this uh, chunk of reading that they just did. And then um, there also is a quiz that you can do um, off of the vocabulary or off of the lesson plan. Um, and that's a screenshot of like the types of questions that are on there. It's on um, a, the quizzes website and it's a link to it on the web page. And then there's also um, a lesson plan slide, like a PowerPoint slide of the lesson plan. So if like teachers wanted to use that as sort of get an idea of how to teach this um, to a class. And that is all. I just wanted to thank my mentor, Anne, and also Corey for having to both teach me R and then help me make all of those graphs for my presentation. And um, also Abigail and Carmela for being super helpful and making this a super fun and interesting experience. And I learned a lot. And I thank Pep for doing a part two. This was really fun to do. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. That was awesome. I know we do have some questions here in the audience, so I will let Lindsay pass the mic. Oh, maybe now. Can you hear me? Yeah, thanks for your presentation. That was great. Um, so my first question is, is, between these two species, do you have thoughts mm -hmm. on what you think will happen um, in terms of their um, population size, in terms of like if with climate changes? So you had one that was an herbivore, I think, and one that was an omnivore. And do you have thoughts about how that, that may impact how they respond? And then my second question is, do you have plans or interest to go to Antarctica? <laughs> um, so I... I do, yes, I, I am actually um, interested in possibly doing some research in Antarctica. Um, I know that um, my mentor has a blog of like what they did while they were on the ship and I thought that was super interesting and it looked like a lot of fun. Um, for me, I think that um, with the different, so with the sea ice retreating at a different time of year, I think that there is gonna be a bit of an effect on the population um, when they're trying to adjust to this um, this period change because the sea ice retreating could bring in um, more of that chlorophyll and nutrients that they need. Um, but I'm not sure how the acutists um, are gonna react to that because they do go through diapause and I'm not sure if they, well, we're not sure if the diapause is um, as a reaction to food scarcity or if it's like um, like a temperature issue. So if it's warmer, I'm not sure if that'll affect the, um, the amount of time that they go through diapause and how that is going to affect their overall energy. Um, for Propinkus, I, I think 
I think my mentor said that they tend to be better uh, over, like they are more spread out, but they had less, we had less propinkus at, we had less sites with propinkus in them. So um, they seem to be sort of even around with the food and gut and the reproduction and stuff, but I'm not sure if uh, they would handle this temperature change as well as the cutest might, because the cutest actually out of the two is the more abundant. Um, and I'm not sure why that is that they're more abundant there. You got it, great, thanks. <laughs> An audience? I want to in the chat. So thank you very much, Adrian. That was excellent. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> thank you. All right, and now give me a second to get set up for our next presenter, if I can remember how to do this. Okay, that looks right. All right, so our next presenter is Reagan Scott, and her presentation is Diversity Trends of Fish Observed Near the Hawaiian Islands. Welcome, Reagan. Hey everybody, um, my name is Reagan. I graduated from the University of North Carolina at Pembroke in, 20, in May of 2020. Um, my mentor is Dr. Brian Stock, who works for NOAA through Extension. And um, I wanna say I was drawn to this project because um, I was really interested in being able to do work that could potentially lead to um, protected protected areas for animals that might need it. I'm so sorry, I forgot to turn the camera on. Oh. <laughs> Where's the camera? Where is the camera? Oh, there she is. Okay. Okay, I'm very sorry. You're fine. Okay, so um, why is marine diversity important? So um, diversity, okay, can I start over? I wanna start over. Okay, so I'm Reagan again, um, Pembroke, Brian Stock, and um, yeah, there we go. So um, I wanted to say that my motivation for choosing this project was to do research that could potentially contribute to the protection or um, yeah, designated and protected areas for marine species if it's needed. Um, so why is it important to study marine diversity? Um, so diversity keeps ecosystems in harmony. So um, in a given habitat, all of the organisms there have um, evolved over time together. So they have developed systems and accommodated each other over time. Um, so when one of those species is lost or if it's populations start dwindling, its specific niche that it does for its habitat, its community is then taken away. So um, this can lead to just an unbalance and nature is all about balance. So it um, throws the entire ecosystem off. Um, yeah. Okay. So another reason to value diversity is diversity equals resilience. So the more diverse a um, ecosystem is the more resilient it can it will be. So if a extreme environmental stressor is placed on that ecosystem, the more diverse it is, the higher its chances are of bouncing back and not having any problems. So um, diversity is very key for to have a well-rounded and strong ecosystem. So these are some of the key species that I found in my data. Um, these were fish found around the Hawaiian Islands. And these fish popped up in, were sighted at least 15,000 times. So these are very, very prevalent species in the Hawaiian region. So my data came from an organization called REEF. It stands for the REEF Environmental Education Foundation. And um, I really like REEF because it bridges the gap between 
non-scientists and scientists. So SRIEF allows um, ordinary people or non-scientists, snorkelers, scuba divers, to go out, do something they really enjoy doing, and also report back their, their observations so scientists can use it for, to draw conclusions. Um, yeah, so anyone that likes to scuba can, can register with REEF and fill out surveys. The surveys ask things about um, the, the temperature of the water when they were diving, how long their dive was, what depth did they dive to, asked about the species that they seen and the uh, estimate of the abundance of the species. And REEF also makes its um, data public and open to anyone, so anyone can use it to do some studying. Um, however, this data does not come from scientists, so it makes it a bit messy. So this data is not standardized in any way. There is various um, temperatures or various depths or various species abundance. It's all dependent upon the surveyor and what they have reported. So um, with a normal scientific finding, you would be able to control as many factors as possible and then change one or two to see how, um, how things would to test that specific factor. So with reef data, we're not really able to do that um, because we have a diverse um, data set. And reef is also depends on abundance. Um, estimates and not exact numbers. You know, usually in science we deal in exact numbers. So Reef asks its surveyors, if you see one fish, that's the number one. If you see two to 10 fish, that's the number two. If anywhere from 11 to 100 fish is a number three and anywhere over 100 is a number four. So very relative estimates of um, these surveys. But um, even though this data is not standardized, it's very valuable. Um, the data set that I worked with had over 20,000, no, nearly 20,000 surveys and included over a million fish sightings. And this data has been collected for over 20 years. Okay, so this is a map of the region I was working with. So these are our for Hawaiian Islands, each of the dots on the map is a site where surveyors have, um, have reported data from. So the, the sites are colored by island. So we have Hawaii's the big island on the bottom. Moving up, there's Maui County. So it's Maui and surrounding islands. And it's Oahu and then Kauai. Um, so I also have this bar plot to show where species were um, most cited. So the diversity metric that I used for my project was just number of species seen in a survey. So I took the averages of those number of, of species seen in the survey and averaged it over islands. And you can see that it's a pretty steep incline. So um, Kauai had the lowest numbers of species sightings and then up to a whole, Oahu and then Maui and then Hawaii, the big island, had the greatest number of species sightings. So this leads to a trend that the closer you are to the big island, the more diverse you can expect your data set to be, your fish sightings to be. Okay, so this is another map. These are those all those same sites, but this time we have colored the sites by average number of species. So the lighter colors, light green, light yellow, shows high numbers of species in a survey. So you can still see on the big island, it's predominantly um, high numbers of surveys. And then on the smaller islands, you have the darker circles, meaning lower species. But this is important to show that not all sites around Hawaii are the most diverse. It has its own variation. And this um, kind of detours from that point I just made about the further you are away from the big island, the less diverse you'll be because um, Kauai, the one in the top corner, it seems to me by this graph that um, it is more diverse than Oahu. So, but we just seen in general from the last graph that um, 
that was not the case, standard over average over all the years. So this is just another way to look at that. And this is Kona Coast. This is just one of the sites that our surveyors survey from, from the Big Island. Okay, so this is a plot of dive time and number of species. So um, the x-axis is the number of minutes spent in the dive and the y-axis is the number of species. So you can see it's a very strong correlation between dive time and number of species. And this is, you know, pretty, pretty realistic. Um, you would think the more time you spend under the water, the more chances you're going to have to look around, the more species you're going to be able to see. Um, so we also chose to filter out data um, with dive times less than 15 minutes. We just figured that was way too short, couldn't really see anything during those times. And we also filtered out data over two hours. Um, there were very few of them and it just made sense to go with a more standard data. Okay, so that this is um, one step build upon the last graph we just looked at. So this is average depth um, versus dive time. So this uh, map is looking graph is looking at the relationship between dive time and average depth. And if you look again, just to reiterate, the darker purples and blues are all on the bottom. So the lower your dive time, the shorter your survey, the lower species you're gonna see. And if you go to the top of the y-axis, you have the light greens, and that shows where there was many species for these long surveys. So, and that is true across any depth. So you can see the gradient from dark purple to green on almost every um, depth. So the line represents the relationship between dive time and average depth. So if you see it peaks around between 20 and 29 um, feet and around 70 minutes. So this would be the optimal depth and optimal time to dive at if you would like to see the most species possible during your survey. But you can see after that peak, it goes down very rapidly. And this is due to, um, the, the deeper you dive, the less time you're gonna have to be down there because your oxygen supply is gonna be more limited and it takes time to get down there. And by the time you get down there, come back up, you don't have much time to look around and look for different fish species. And there are some, yeah, yeah practical reasons for this. Um, oxygen tanks will, yeah, run out. I already said that. <laughs> Okay, so this is a graph of, this is a linear regression graph of year over average number of species, and it's um, separated out by islands. So you can see the different trends that happen on each of the different islands. Um, there was significant increase in number of species on three of the four islands, so Oahu, Hawaii, and Maui. Um, and Oahu actually had the most impressive gradient um, going from averaging about 30 species in 2000 and almost hitting 50 species in 2020. So these, these, three, these three islands have increased. And this also goes along with the idea of um, the closer you are to Hawaii, the more diverse it is. So we can see that Hawaii's line is way above, they already have more species. Maui had a steep increase and Oahu is kind of the surprise factor here because it had a much steeper increase than expected. So for future studies, um, yeah, I would say it was very surprising. I would not think um, with today's discussions of climate change and pollution that the three out of the four islands would have had such a steep increase in um, number of species. Um, but I think these findings need to be studied further um, to be sure. Um, first, it needs to be compared to other similar studies in a, in a similar region, in the Hawaiian region to see if the findings are similar. That will be a good you know, confirmation if this is good data or not. 
Um, and secondly, I think this data should be calculated with a different diversity metric. So I was not able to um, consider abundance of species in my diversity. I just counted the presence or absence of various species. So yeah, I think if we counted abundance, maybe these graphs would look a lot different. Um, and a way to do that would be using the like the Shannon, Shannon diversity index or another type of metric. Um, so to bring it back home, um, these are the animals that this research has been about. Um, I think sometimes when we deal with data, it, we kind of forget what we're actually talking about because it's just numbers at that point. But these are real species. These are real, their livelihoods, I guess you could say. Um, yeah, so just keeping track on them and their numbers and seeing if they are able to survive. Um, these species were seen less than 10 times in all 20,000 surveys. So these species have only been seen a, just literally a handful of times in those 20,000 surveys. And I would definitely say for the one in the top corner, it's well camouflaged. So that might be a big factor there. Um, yeah. Pretty ugly, but yeah. <laughs> and do we have any questions? <laughs> yes. Hey, uh, Ben Harden here from SCA. Um, <laughs> It's a fascinating data set, really nice job. Um, really difficult to work with citizen scientists data, lots of you know things, stories to find inside the data. So you did a great job explaining all of that and working that out. Um, Thank you. Were you surprised that there seems to be increases in abundance? I mean, like most of these, I feel like my instinct is most of these surveys are set up because people are worried about loss of diversity. Right. Was that a surprise to you and other researchers? Yeah, um, I definitely think so. Um, my first, my th first thought, it does not, you know, doesn't mean anything yet, but maybe the surveyors who are reporting to reef surveys are getting more experience. Maybe they're getting better at identifying these species. Maybe they tried it the first time, seen 10 species, but only could identify five, so they only reported on five, and then now they are getting more and more experienced, and that is how they are able to show an increase in number of species, has been my theory so far. <laughs> I was interested to see that relationship between dive time and number of species. Do you think that maybe people are also taking longer dives more recently because they were interested in doing this? Hmm, yeah, I, yeah, I definitely think that could be a, a component because, yeah, it, once you're experienced, you're more comfortable under the water for two hours and you'll be able to see that many more species. So I definitely think that could be a possibility. Most fascinating. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Hello, Reagan. Hey. I was wondering if, so I like your maps and the maps that showed more species on the big Hawaiian island. Um, do you think that's because it's of the larger area or did you standardize it by unit area, uh, the number of species? Um, I, I think it I think it could be the because it's of a, a larger area and more diverse um, habitats within that one island, you know, more rocky habitat, smooth habitat. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. And I had another question, um, but I seem to have forgotten it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Xavier's got a question and we can come back if you want. Okay. Um, okay, so I had a question about the, the map of Hawaii, the Hawaiian Islands. Mm -hmm. So you had a bunch of like plot points for each of the sites. Did those sites have a structured like area that it was because it was just like said site, so I wasn't sure if it was like, okay, one site might be significantly smaller than another. And so it's um, susceptible to being seen as like having smaller diversity in it. Right. Okay, so the sites have their own um, geographic code. So when you go to fill out the survey, you will put in your geographic code and those sites and geographic codes are determined by reef. So reef has, they, I think they kind of set the boundaries that you can set within water to determine this the size of this site and try to average them out to be fairly the same size and cover the same area. So 
But yeah, Reef handled that. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about the, the mechanics of how divers record the data. Do you, do you know how that works? Do they have some way of writing something down while they're diving? Because it would be really hard to remember all that stuff, right? Like, yeah, I'm not sure what they do when they're actually under the water. I, I didn't get to that part, um, but I did go through reef survey and it's very simplistic. So I think if you could, you could do it within a day and kind of have a good um, indication of what the, what the data is asking for. So, yeah. Those must be people with better memories than mine. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's what I was wondering. So they have some way of writing it down as they go. Thank you. Yeah. Wait, you got to repeat that before. Oh, they, it's up to the diver. However, they want to record the data is what they do. Um, but they do, Reef does produce a checklist. Um, that they can print off on underwater paper and take it with them and check it off. Cool. All right. I think that's all the time we have for questions if you want to keep going. Okay. I'm going to move on to my work with the Falmouth Public Schools. Okay. So um, my project with the Falmouth Public Schools, I'm working with teacher Katie Carl back there. Um, also teacher Lisa Howell and Stacy Strong. She is the math coach for, over Falmouth Elementary Schools. And um, some for my project, um, I am working with seven year olds. So teaching seven year olds how to, or trying to accommodate all of the complicated and R maps and all of those things, trying to make that fun and understandable for seven year olds. So that has been my project with working with Falmouth Public Schools. So the way we came up with doing this is trying to simulate an underwater dive for the students. So um, the lesson plan kind of goes like where they would start with discussions about what is a habitat, uh, what is a marine habitat, and kind of get them focused on that. Then they would, um, they're going to Zoom with a scientist to be able to ask questions about um, underwater species or what a coral reef is or questions that a seven-year-old might have about something like that. Um, then they'll be watching a a video recording of a dive. Each student is going to be assigned their own species to be on the lookout for. So um, they're going to keep keep a lookout for their one species and keep a tally mark. And then, yeah, I don't want I don't want to get into that yet. So yeah, yeah. Oh, and I put Nemo and Dory because I expected a lot of students to be able to pick out Nemo and Dory, Dory and be excited to talk about them. Um, so I don't want to get ahead of myself because this is the worksheet that this was my biggest contribution to um, my work with the Thomas Public Schools. So this is the worksheet that I created for the seven-year-olds. So this was me trying to um, simulate a seven-year-old friendly reef survey. So I put my map that I cr we created um, just for them to kind of have fun to be able to see where we're talking about that we're looking at. And they can go circle them, circle whichever island they feel like circling. That's kind of just for fun, but it also shows them where they're actually getting, the, where we're getting this data from, where this dive is going to come from. So um, another like science skill we introduced was a scale gradient. So the questions I asked were how visible was the water? So that's just a one through three scale instead of the answer. They were supposed to look at the scale, determine um, the answer based on the number and put their number in the highlighted box. Um, so I asked about visibility because I figured it would be easy for a seven-year-old to do. And I also asked about dive just to let them kind of pick and show them these are the kind of questions that divers have, divers do and is relevant to actual diving. So then at the bottom, they just um, write the name of their fish and they have space to tally up their fish sightings. Um, so then they'll get together in small groups and record the names of their group members fish and then they're going to use this scale again. So this is 
a almost exact replica of the scale that Reef uses, except for theirs goes to over 100, and I just scaled it back to over 10 because you know they're seven. Um, so yeah, so they are just gonna share with each other. I had seven tally marks, so that means I should do number three, and they're circle number three. So that is how that is going to go. And the scientist that they're meeting with is me. I get to be the scientist. <laughs> so I'm going to be, um, yeah, plans are for me to, when school's back in order and this is able to um, be executed, um, yeah, I'm supposed to Zoom with the students. So I'm going to have to read up on all kid-friendly fish questions, coral reef questions, everything that I think try to prepare for what they might be able to ask. So yeah, that's everything. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, no. Um, these are my acknowledgements. Um, Dr. Brian Stock, he's been wonderful. Um, showing me how to code a lot of stuff that I did not know how to code before. Um, Stacy Strong, Katie Carl, and Lisa Howell for working with me for Falmouth Public Schools. Dr. Ben Harden and his wife, um, Elizabeth Lyles for their teaching seminar. <laughs> And Angie for putting PEP2 together and letting me be here. That's awesome. And all the other PEP staff and everyone else who has had a hand in me being able to do this for a second time around. So it's been really fun. Thank you, C Semester is housing us. We're told diversity committee is the reason PEP exists. Reef gave me my data. C Grant funded it. And um, I work with Noah through Brian, who works with Noah. So that is my acknowledgement. Thanks, Reagan. That was that was really great. All right. Oh, there we go. All right, our next presentation is Christopher Sandoval, Loggerhead Sea Turtle Migration Patterns in the Mid-Atlantic Bite. Welcome, Chris. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Christopher Sandoval. I'm a recent graduate from the University of Texas at El Paso, and my mentor is Joshua Patch. Uh, he works for NOAA Fisheries. And we're going to be talking again about loggerhead sea turtle migration patterns in the Mid-Atlantic Bite. So a little background about my internship. It took place uh, virtually this year um, and last year, according, of course, because of pandemic situations. And um, But the, the, the normal case is it's in the Northeast Fisheries Science Center under the PEP program. Um, we're going to be looking at the loggerhead sea turtle, scientific name, uh, Coretta Coretta, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, and uh, what we did with these turtles, or what they did with the turtles since 2009, they've been capturing, tag tagging um, turtles and releasing them into the water around the greater Atlantic and Southeast regions of the world, of the US, I'm sorry. Um, and on top of here, this, this picture up here, you're gonna see uh, a, a kind of a, a variation of the sea turtles you're gonna be finding in the Atlantic and Gulf Coast regions of the United States. Um, but we're gonna be looking at the loggerhead turtle specifically, that's gonna be our species. And the bottom right, on the bottom right is going to be a picture of one of the individuals that were actually captured and tagged and released um, by the members um, in my team. Um, this is kind of a picture I wanted to use to kind of give a description of the size of a uh, of the carapace of a loggerhead sea turtle. Now, unfortunately, you can't really get a gist of it because it's just kind of floating in the ocean. But to give an idea, it's about uh, 80 to 90 centimeters in length. And I'll get more into like how we uh, measure that a little later. Now, again, this is a we're going to be looking at the North Atlantic region, but uh, this species is actually a global species. It's found pretty much in almost every ocean you can imagine. Um, and on the top, you can kind of see um, those two points. Uh, with this, those, those two points are the greatest, uh, uh, what do they call it, um, nesting grounds that you can find in the world. Is, um, those two individual sighting nesting grounds have over 10,000 females that, um, that, that visit those sites per year. So those have the highest number of individuals, um, at least females. The one on the right is uh, Oman, which is going to be in the uh, Arabian Peninsula, and on the left is going to be the South in South Florida. That's going to be our region. And here on the bottom is kind of an example of uh, 
of migration patterns. Now, this isn't what a migration pattern is. This is actually a um, North. This is the North Atlantic gyre. Now, a gyre is just a system of different currents and streams and uh, different kinds of things that are moving and um, you know, just currents and streams that make up one giant system. For example, in this case, it's going to be the North Atlantic gyre. Now, this is important because this is the different. This is kind of the the system that a, uh, a loggerhead sea turtle takes. It's a clockwise pattern. They use these currents to get from place to place. They do venture off the currents every now and then for foraging, resting, things like that. So it does take a long time for them to move and that's why they use these currents. Okay, uh, now understanding, this is, this is gonna be our objective, um, understanding the migration patterns of loggerhead sea turtles in the Mid-Atlantic site. Now this is an endangered species, so it is part of the Endangered Species Act. Um, so the work that we've been doing over the months and since 2009 is very important for the survival, the protection, and the conservation of this species. And I'll get into a little bit more um, near the end on why this kind of information is important for the preservation of this species. Now, the Mid-Atlantic bite, I've been saying it multiple times, but what is it? Uh, so this, before I get into where, where it is, it's what is a bite? A bite is essentially a long gradual bend or recess on a shoreline, as you can see there, that forms a large open bay. So this is essentially right there. That, that's gonna be the, the bite right there. This is the Mid-Atlantic bite. Where is it? This is the this is going to be running on the coastal region from uh, Massachusetts all the way down to North Carolina. So this entire region is our area of interest. This is where most of the, the tagging took place. So a lot of our members or a lot of our individuals are going to be in this site. And um, what we're basically what we want to look at here is we want to see if individuals or when individuals are leaving the Mid-Atlantic Bight. And we defined that by that red line at the bottom right there, which is going to be your 35 degree um, north latitude point. We chose that point because for us, it, it kind of represented a really good, uh, it was a good representation of when an ind individual sea turtle was leaving the Mid-Atlantic Bight and beginning to migrate away from the, uh, mid, uh, the MAB. Um, and we ch that's just a choice that we made. Uh, there's no, even the other, other individuals, there are papers out there that have chosen that same re um, latitude, but that was just something we chose because we felt that it really you know, respected the migration patterns that normally happen. Okay, some of the methodology that I went through. Now, uh, just before I get into the actual, just the, some of the pictures that we have here, this is an image of a satellite tag that is put on the, uh, placed on the carapace of a sea turtle. And if I am correct, um, I believe that uh, these tags have to be less than 5% the weight of a individual so that, you know, it doesn't bother them. They don't really notice that it's there. They can just float around with it. It's not a big problem. Um, this graph right here represents the average links that we chose um, or they chose since 2009 all the way till 2019, the data set that I have. It, it is continuous to this day. On, um, the, so the size is going to be about 80 to 90, cent, uh, to 90 centimeters average. Um, there are different, of course, there's variables within that, but that is the average length. And the way that is, this isn't one of my curls, by the way, this is an example of how they measure it. So they start from the anterior point. Uh, they go down the midline, up the, down to the posterior notch, which is between those two little um, kind of spiky points. So that's how they that's how they measure that, and then we kind of get an idea of how long. And uh, you know, it gives it gives you an age difference too. The the size of an individual turtle is kind of how you um, find out the size of a turtle. Uh, there's not that's not many other ways you can do it. There are other ways, but they're a lot more. Um, uh, they they require more physical contact with the turtle, and we want to take as little time with them as possible because it's a very stressful experience. Um, so basically with the satellite tugs, the satellite tag, it's tagged on the back of the seed turtle, uh, the carapace, I'm sorry. And it will send information uh, via satellite telemetry, essentially meaning that whenever a turtle, any information that wants to be sent, such as uh, dive depth, time, temperature, uh, there's many variables that go into this. And there's a lot of variables that are going into this uh, satellite tag, and it's going to be sent to the satellite down into a, um, uh, what is it called? a ground area. Someone's some, going to get the data. They're going to compress it for us and so we're gonna, we're basically, it's gonna be available for us to then data process, clean and organize. And uh, this is probably the part where I took the most time, which is cleaning and organizing. This took me a long, long time. I'm gonna get into a little bit of details on why it took so long. Um, and then of course, setting up the actual data and then we're gonna manipulate, we want to manipulate the data to kind of see if um, climate change is a variable in this and if individual sea turtles are leaving at earlier or later dates because of warming temperatures. Um, and uh, for, the, for this experiment, we had over 250 individuals. So we had over 250 sea turtles that we had tagged when I got into this. Um, now I wanted to get into a little bit more about the data and the process that it took and 
I don't know why it's messed up, okay. Um, so I call it the quirks of data. The quirks of data are essentially the little things that happen in data that you just can't control or they just change or something. You know, there's many variables that go into this stuff. So over 250 individuals, of those 250 individuals, they each contained um, from tens to hundreds to thousands of points each. So I was working with thousands of data points per individuals. And depending on how many points I was working on, it, that, that would, that would uh, determine how long it would take. So to make one of these uh, maps, for example, it would take me about, this isn't a, this isn't a, this is an example of, uh, of a seal. I wasn't able to pull one out for a sea turtle, unfortunately. But this is actually a very small data set. This probably wouldn't take me very long. Now, if an individual had, let's say, 1,000 to 7,000 points, I would sit there and I would wait for this map to get created. It took me about 45 minutes to an hour just to make one single little map. So, you know, times that times 250 individuals and then, you know, whatever individuals were less or more, but it did take me a long time to do that. Um, but the other thing that is also important is the more points that we had, the more clear it was and the more visual we could see. So essentially what we we're making with these maps here is we had all these points, this is all those points are where the individual was at that point or at that time. And then you can create a line to kind of follow where where that individual was moving um, to. And then you can see those points are kind of out on the edge. Those, those, I had to determine whether that was a natural event or is something that was just obscure and I had to remove myself. Now, this is something that's based heavily on my part. So, um, you know, that, that, that brings in the potential of human error or other things like that. Um, there were very few times where I had to do it. And I tried to limit it as small as possible to not hurt, to, to change the data too much. Um, and of course, also the, the, they're heavily spaced apart sometimes. And I'll get into a little bit more. I'll show you an example of what I mean, um, what I mean by parts, the spacing. It, 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 it does happen here, but there's also other examples of it as well. And then of course, keeping track and staying consistent. This part, uh, this right here, I don't expect anybody to even manage to read all this. I just wanted to give you an example of what I was working with. Every individual I worked with, I had to put a little bit of data in and I had to make a description um, about everyone. And I had to make sure it was very con consistent and I wasn't missing things or adding things that didn't need to be there. So um, this, this part also took me quite a while. All right, so after we finally create those maps, we're able to you know, remove points and kind of get an idea of where they are. We were able to create a, latitude, a, a graph with the date on the bottom on the x-axis, latitude on the y-axis. We can kind of see when an individual leaves. This is a really important graph for me because I was able to zoom into this certain point right here. And I was able to determine at which point, at least objectively, which point um, that, because uh, they would tell me the, the date, but um, there would be two date points. And I would have to determine in the middle where I thought the individual had possibly left the Mid-Atlantic Bight. And then I would mark that down um, so we could follow it later. It was only one point. So I did it. So we have all these multiple jumble happening here. At the end right here, this is the part that I care about. None of this matters. Even though it came in and came out, this is the part that matters because that's what it was. This is an example of an individual who left the Mid-Atlantic Bight, stayed in the bottom, stayed uh, around 34 uh, degree north point for a while, and then came back up. Since he was out for a long period of time, or at least a decent period of time, I would mark this individual as leaving the Mid-Atlantic Bight. I don't, I didn't mark this, but this was important. I said I just wanted to have it in my in my information, but I was marking when they returned to. But that's not going to be part of the video what we're doing today. Now I have two examples of an individual that stayed north and one that stayed south. This is the one that stayed north. I wouldn't mark anything here. I would just write down that the individual stayed north, never crossed, that's it. Same thing here. We had an individual that stayed south, never went up, stayed. This, could, this is a very stagnant, um, this could be uh, just wrong information. It could also be that there's very few, you can also tell in this one there's very few points compared to the rest, it's not very clustered together. Um, so that could be because of that. Um, but that is, this is like another example of what you just don't write that down. It's just, so I just wanted to show you that. Now we finally get to where we, what we wanted in this whole situation is uh, we wanted to make sure, we wanted to see the changes in migration patterns within loggerhead sea turtles um, in response to climate change. Is it something that's happening? Um, is it something we need to be aware about? Um, did we find nothing? So we have the x-axis, we have years. On the y-axis, we have billion days. Now billion days are essentially just one to 365. Um, so it's 365 days of the year, uh, January 1st being one, December 31st being 365. There's a, there's a lot of ways to read billion days, but that's the simplistic way to do it, for this graph at least. Um, and I, but I added uh, the months, so it could be a lot easier for us to follow. Um, we can kind of determine seasonally when they're migrating out of the MAB. So I wanted to get, before I get into like what we're looking at, I want to make sure that we can also follow it. It's kind of messy and loud. It took me a while to even figure this thing out. 
had to get to more, I had to go through multiple game time rooms and I could actually finally do it. And even then, I might not be able to do that. <laughs> um, but so we have the this little bar here is your asterisk. This is going to be your averages of individuals that are leaving the minute maximum pipe. The n equals is the individuals that are leaving the minute maximum pipe. So they have crossed over um, officially, like the kids can come in with there. The black dots are outliers. Those are individuals that left way earlier, way later than they normally do. Or the, the things to note with those outliers are heavily pulling on those asterisks, the averages. Um, so they are changing a lot of things there, and they're kind of making things um, a little bit wonky in some areas or in a lot of areas. Um, and then it's another thing to note that's also important called present median is also median on the average. But in 2009, 2009, which is the start of the uh, of the project, we only had very few tags. There were very few tags, so we got even lucky to just get one individual to cross the MAB, to be honest. So uh, that's why we don't see much going on there. And then in 2019, uh, apparently a lot of the a lot of the, the satellite tags just malfunctioned, so we we lost a lot of data. We don't have a lot of data um, for that year. We only had two individuals cross, and on top of that, it's just very skewed. Um, it, it, I mean, it looks very average, but there's there's two out, there's two individuals pulling on each other, so it doesn't really represent anything for us. It's just two two guys that are just leaving at two different parts of the year. Um, so what are we looking at here? Basically, we, we we have a line, we have a trend, sort of. We can kind of see the line in the beginning from 2009 to 2013 and kind of dips a little bit. Um, I can't really tell you what's happening that year, why it dipped, um, why is it different than the rest of the years, or at least. From 2014 to 2017, it could be the number of individuals that passed. Um, as you can see in the top, a lot of it, it, even though we had over 250 individuals, only 75 total individuals actually crossed since 2009 to 2019. So there's not a lot. I wouldn't say it's very fair representative of the sample size that we actually used. Um, so we didn't get the, you know, we ended up with this graph, but it doesn't have the best information. But um, one of the things to know is this is this is preliminary data. This is one of the first times we're seeing this. Um, this is only a decade of data. And I know it sounds like a lot, but a decade of data for a loggerhead sea turtle is nothing when it comes to migration, especially with individuals this small. So um, in the future, I want to make sure that if it continue in the next 10 years, we might be seeing something way more obvious. There may be trends here. We just can't see it. Not to say that's bad. Now a little bit about the discussion and conclusion. Um, I talked about the number, maybe increasing the number of individuals, but in this case, we didn't have a lot of, uh, at least that passed, we did have loads of individuals, but not many of them passed. And we also had data errors. And um, in the very beginning, we didn't have much uh, hurdles. So that, that those are all very big factors in why we ended up with the information that we ended up with. And then another thing to mention is the outliers that I talked about, they're heavily pulling on the averages. Um, there was something that we, it was something that we were we wanted to um, add to remove. We could have a little get, get rid of all the outliers at the bottom, so that maybe that we have we would have less skews in the box plots, and it would actually be more legible. And maybe we'd even see trends. But as the way it is, we don't see much going on. Um, and then of course we have errors. Errors happen in any project, really. And uh, one of the things to know is these systems they they're satellite tags. They send information via satellite. So if there's bad weather. Or biofouling, which is basically when ocean components start, like organisms start um, overcrowding on and growing on the satellite tag, it interferes with the satellite, um, uh, so I guess, reception. And you won't be able to send it. And you end up with data that looks like this sometimes. You'll have um, in, in, in the late October or whenever mid year, um, uh, 2012, we lost complete, nothing happened until 2013. It's not like the, you just shot, you know, to one point to another. It just means that something happened. It was either something like that. It was biofouling. It was weather. It could have been detachment. Um, obviously, I mean, well, it probably wasn't detachment. It probably wasn't death. Um, it could be a system fail. But um, since we do get the individual coming back, it's probably something like weather or biofouling. OK, so why is all of this important? All of this information is just important to, like I said before, this is a, this is a threatened species, um, endangered species. It's, it's, out there and the information that we put out there is essential for places like um, fisheries and vessels who are moving through the waters who need to know and understand that these sea turtles could be in that area. They, they don't want to, they don't, you, don't, you don't want to end up with vessel strikes or, or by catching by accident. So a lot of the, a lot of the equipment that we have nowadays, um, the modifications, I guess you'd say on, on fisheries, is you can kind of see these little grayish part at the bottom of the net. Um, that is an area where it's big enough to capture the fish 
um, that, or whatever they're trying to capture, but it's, it's small enough that it won't capture the sea turtles. So we're avoiding sea turtle contact. Um, nobody's getting caught and hopefully they're being protected. And then also we're gonna be giving this kind of information to vessels so that if they're traveling through a certain area, they won't go ahead and hit any sea turtles and they'll avoid those areas through certain times of the year. And then of course, climate change. That's the biggest part of the project. Is climate change a factor here? Is it changing the migration patterns of these loggerhead, loggerhead sea turtles? Um, as of right now, I cannot tell you for certain it is. It is something that we're gonna have to continue to study. It's important to study. Uh, just recently, uh, this is actually new information to me, I read yesterday, but the Gulf Stream is collapsing it right before our eyes, it's slowing down. Um, so that's, that's, that's a big factor. These are all big factors when it comes to the loggerhead sea turtle. How is this gonna affect them? Is it gonna alter their patterns? Is it gonna, is it gonna hurt them in any way? Um, so this study needs to be continued as, uh, you know, as it is, and maybe add and change some um, areas of it. Uh, future research. Now, uh, I think this is a big one, tagging other population segments, essentially meaning age groups, um, younger turtles and um, things like that. Uh, this, is, this, is this is probably a really small turtle. I don't think we have satellite tags that are that massive. And again, it has to be like less than 5%. Um, it would be very uncomfortable if it was that. But the thing is, they're, the, the two things I think the biggest factors when it comes to young and sea turtles, is, especially hatching, is um, they're very, the, the, their survival rate is small. They, they, have, they have so many that come out of those nesting grounds, but so many of them die. Like, there's just, it's crazy how many survive. So we can't just be tagging every single one and hoping they don't get eaten because they're going to get eaten. So we have to, you know, I think it's, it's important to find a good year, a good um, age, um, I guess, determined um, when we should start so we can have longer date periods for longer periods of times. This kind of information is awesome. It's, it's going to be very essential to the future of this species, I think. And um, if we don't continue this, it, it's just going to be a dire situation. And without this information, I feel like fisheries and other programs would definitely use this kind of stuff and just wouldn't care. Um, they would catch if they could. It's just about the money for a lot of these programs. So um, I think that this study and the forcing of these kinds of um, um, implemented uh, things when it comes to sea turtles is very, very essential to their survival. And I guess that's it for my research. How you doing? I know you said you were uh, the tagging was was uh, difficult at some points. Would you consider in the future maybe like using like different is is there a way you could use like different uh, tagging? What's the word I'm looking for? Sorry. Yeah, tagging methods or tagging. Well, the the tagging part itself is it's not that hard. It's just a little bit stressful on the animal. You have to be quick, and it's not just tagging. They're doing a lot of things to the turtle. They're taking blood and things like that. Um, so it's not just one little thing. So they have to be as quick as possible. I think that the method they have now is probably the best method that you can probably do um, since they're not, they're, not, they're not just tagging, they're doing multiple things. I'm sure if it was just tagging, it'd be a lot easier, but they have to, you know, they have these huge nets. They bring them onto the, uh, the small area of a boat and then everybody's surrounding it, they're holding it, they're giving it shots. It's a really quick process and it's very, very nerve wracking. I imagine for the species, they're gonna do it quick. I don't think there's any, I mean, there might be other methods that I, I'm not aware of, but as of right now, I think that's one of the better methods that we have right now. And I had another question. Sure. Was ooh, sorry, brain fart. Uh, <laughs> ooh, yeah, I, it just went out my brain. Oh my god! Then when I saw the question, it might it'll come back to me. Okay, so you you talked about how um there was like the significant like thirty five was it thirty five degrees north like yeah, for the latitude right. that they leave the mid Atlantic bite. Right. Uh, is it possible that there's a a specific or special longitude also that they could leave the bite by? Uh, to be honest, I haven't looked into that. I can imagine it has. I mean, if you look at the on that slide. So you kind of see that it just kind of skews at the bottom. So you don't have it. You just kind of hope. I mean, I don't know if I truly really said it. If you look over here, and like this, and down here. Um, so I kind of agree with you. I think it, it would be essential to add something like that in the future. I haven't talked about it, so I don't know the ins and outs of why. Maybe it was time. Um, uh, maybe it's not important for this method. I'm not really sure, um, to be honest. That's a good question, and I'm definitely going to keep it in mind for next time. All right, I came back. 
were you ever able to recover any of the tags that were like lost or did they just sink down completely? Uh, okay, so I have two things I can talk about that. So one is it has happened. It's hella rare. Um, it, it doesn't happen pretty much ever because uh, once it falls into the ocean, it's in the ocean. I mean, it, it, it happens. The one time that I know it happened and this is my mentor telling me is uh, some fisheries caught it and there's information on the tag so they can send it to them. And they have, they have, they have gotten it, sent it to them and they received it later. Um, so it does happen, but that is a very rare incident. Oh, and then the second thing is, uh, uh, oh, great. Now I forgot. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, that humans, uh, there, there are cases in which humans have uh, killed an animal, not turtle specifically. I have, I, and the things I've read, it was more of a bird. They killed an endangered bird. They got the tag and then they hid the tag. So those cases do happen as well. Um, it's, it's, it's uncommon, but it does happen. <laughs> Hello, um, your research was really awesome, but I was wondering, um, just because you were only looking at like 35 um, degrees north and there were so few individuals that actually crossed, um, do you have any like ideas on why so few actually crossed? Uh, I mean, it's really undetermined at this point, realistically. I mean, um, maybe it was the attitude we chose. Maybe we need a little different attitude. Maybe it's... Uh, Maybe like he said, maybe I need to add a, a longitude. It could be a lot of variables. Um, this, again, this is preliminary data. So we're just getting into this. This is something I, I, I wanted to do since last year. Um, so I'm still getting my feet with this too. So, um, you know, these are the kinds of questions that I need to hear. And I think, yeah, it's important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So I'll talk a little bit about the FPS collaboration. Um, so the, the Falmouth Public School collaboration, I got to work with the wonderful Sharon Milliken. Um, she's a biology teacher. She's been doing, she's been doing this for 20th, 20th year of teaching at Falmouth now. She teaches marine ecology and forensic science at the 8th, 11th and 12th grade level. Um, and a little bit about what we did together. Um, so I just created a really pretty much a huge PowerPoint detailing both my research studies that I did last year and this year. Um, this is 11th and 12th grade level, so I wanted to make sure that this is something that, you know, these, these are young scientists, they're about to get out there in the world and, and start going and doing things that are really important. Um, and I think that this is the kind of information that I think they would love to see so that they can kind of get an idea um, of the sea turtle. They're, they're, I mean, there are sea turtles out here. Um, it, they, if they see it, I feel like after learning about it, it gets, it gets you really excited. Um, so things like that. And I also want to make sure that these young scientists go out into the world and, you know, continue what we're doing now. It's, this is very important information. So uh, it, was also, it, was also, it was also very interactive, um, but it's about the loggerhead sea turtle. It has both of my objectives last year and this year. So the dive profiles from last year that I did, um, essentially looking at all this right here, we're looking at, um, instead of looking at when they were migrating, we were looking at their dive profiles and kind of getting ideas of what the individual sea turtle was doing. Um, and the way I, I, I uh, set it up so that we could have interaction with the students is this is a dive profile that moved, it's an entire video. There are certain sections of a dive profile um, Cheryl's going to, or she's going to go ahead and take parts of it and she's going to break it up and she's going to have her students in groups. And those, those groups of students are going to kind of get this section right here, any section that she chooses, and they're going to put it with this on top and they're going to kind of determine themselves what that sea turtle might be doing at that time. Um, it's important to understand that even though this is a very descriptive, uh, it, there's a lot of information about what each individual is doing here. It doesn't necessarily mean they're actually doing that. Um, we're not there, we don't have cameras on them, so we don't actually know what they're doing. It's just kind of a, it's kind of broad strokes um, or kind of what they normally look like when they do that. Um, yeah, okay. And of course the importance of this research, climate change is a thing, it's here, it's, it's getting pretty wild out there. I don't know, we've, we've seen the news. Um, I, I think we're all a little scared lately and it, it's, it's a scary future. Um, but you know, this is not just for us and it's important for the species around us. Um, I think that's one of the things that we have to make sure that we take charge of is not just worrying about humankind, but everything. Um, we, talk, we talked about uh, with, with Regan, the whole importance of diversity within all these things. If we start losing any ketones, any ketone species, it's, that's just a trickle down into collapse pretty much. And of course, involving students, this is always an important part with science. In any study, I believe, you always want to involve the students to make sure that they have fun and um, you know, that they learn about some cool species and then when they get out there in the world and they can actually have some you know, knowledge about what they're talking about when they see something like that. Acknowledgements.
Uh, Chris, yes. uh, the question I have is, uh, and just the thought, a uh, couple of things is uh, relative to creature comfort in terms of your uh, critters leaving or remaining in an mm -hmm. area. And I'm just curious uh, how much we really know uh, about the impact of the tagging and whether that uh, might contribute to how long a tag individual would remain in an area versus those that have not been tagged. Right. And then the other idea I would think about is we obviously got to this point uh, with regards to uh, the uh, tagging uh, satellites usage and, and, and what have you. So where, where is the research going with regards to maybe a less invasive tag mm. uh, or, or, or are we getting into any sort of uh, area where, uh, you know, the, the um, signal is powerful enough uh, to track an individual without a tag or just maybe something very uh, less invasive. Right, well, I think, uh, I mean, that's a good, good, good idea, maybe even lighter. Um, you know, there are factors that, that are determined into any species um, there, there, there's rules and laws when it comes to this kind of stuff that you have to follow when you tag a, a sea turtle. It has to be in a certain weight um, and things like that. The thing with the carapace, I mean, I can't speak to the sea turtle itself, but um, you know, it's it's small enough and not heavy enough that it should be relatively un. They shouldn't feel it really. Um, there are other uh, tags I've seen, like for the small. I don't know how I was talking about future research of smaller tags. There are that wrap around the entire sea turtle, and that seems way more invasive and like that could cause a lot more trouble. Um, I think they're, they're, in the future, we'll definitely have smaller tags and we'll be able to do a lot more things. Um, I think that is important and it could definitely be a factor in determining what they're doing. Maybe it is doing something that we just don't know that. I think that's very important. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. All right, our next presenter is Angela Trejo, and her presentation is Estimating Current and Future Ecosystem Services from the Florida Keys Reef. So, hello, everyone. I'm Angela Trejo. I'm a recent grad graduate from the University of Texas at El Paso. I studied environmental science. And today I'm going to be talking about estimating current and future ecosystem services from the Florida Keys Reef. This summer I worked in the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institutions Marine Policy Center under Dr. Hauser Kite Powell. And I'm really excited to show you my research. So my two main questions for the summer were to first identify the ecosystem services provided by the Florida Keys Reef. And then once we had identified those, we wanted to put a value to them and estimate how these services and their values may change over time. So here is an area map of the Florida Keys Reef. I got this from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. I was able to load the data into ArcMap, which is a mapping program, and from there calculate the area of the reef. So I calculated 143 square kilometers. This will come into our calculations later to determine the value of some of the services provided. So here you can see, I was looking at the upper, middle, lower, and Key West. So I've talked a little bit about ecosystem services so far, but I haven't defined them. So ecosystem services can be thought about as the benefits that we receive for our environment. So these can be a multitude of different things from storm protection that our coast may provide to us to just being able to go out and enjoy wildlife or go out and swim. All of those are benefits that we get because the environment is there. So using the 2003 Millennium Ecosystem Service Assessment, we organized our ecosystem services into three different categories. The first category is regulatory services. These are services that we get from the ecosystem regulating itself. So these are things like water filtration, erosion control, and storm um, protection, as I talked about earlier. Any of those things would fall into the, that category. The second category is provisional services. 
these are the physical benefits that we may get from the environment, such as our food, our water, any raw materials that we are taking out of there, all go under provisional. And the last kind of service is the weirdest to think about, but also the most fun. These are cultural services. They are more cognitive. So these would be recreation when you go swimming, um, boating, fishing, anything like that. Even if you go out on a hike and you get to view a wonderful bird, that is a service that our ecosystem is providing to you. E experimental services also fall under here. So if we are able to get some kind of substance from the ocean and use that for science advancement, that goes under cultural services. So we were able to get values or estimate the values for these different services in different ways, looking first at regulatory services we used an estimate from a report that we looked at that was estimating the value of a coral reef per square kilometer. So using that map that I showed you previously, I was able to estimate the value uh, of the area and then multiply that by the estimated value per square kilometer. And that gave us our regulatory value. For a provisional value, we looked again at the Fish and Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission for their data on the food and bait caught from 2018 and the value that they had assigned to that. And for cultural, this was the hardest for us to define because you don't often find people asking, how often did you go swimming this last year? So what we did was we looked at whatever statistics were available, both for the visitors, any tourists to the Florida Keys, as well as the residents. And we looked at few statistics of days. So even if you're one individual, if you're going to the reef, five times, then that counts as five days. So using all of these different um, use statistics, we told them up and multiplied them by an estimated value per day per person from the United States Forestry Service. So these were made by activities and they would assign about like $21 if you wanted to go boating per person per day and so on. So here are the results of those calculations. Regulating and habitat take up about 80% of the e current ecosystem value per year. This is in million USD. And that is about $300,000 million. Provisioning services are about 70, they're our lowest. And then cultural services are about 580 million. And both provisional and cultural take up about 20% of the other ecosystem services that we are receiving from the reef currently. So while we were thinking about how we are going to estimate these services in the future, we first have to think about the obstacles that the reef will overcome or not overcome in some cases. So here is a map that I took from the National Park Service and it's showing the comparison of the 50th percentile of sea level rise. So these predictions, this is like the 50th percent. And that shows, but if we go up to the 99th percentile of sea level rise projections, then we get a lot more of our area being covered. So what we decided to do is use sea level rise as one of our variables that we would account for in our model. And we categorize that as reef access, because if the sea level rises, then we will have to worry about whether it's harder to get to the reef. Maybe you have to take a longer boat together to get there. Perhaps the roads will be cut off and it's harder to reach those areas. So that is one thing that will affect some tourists or some residents that might say, forget it, we're not going to go anymore. Um, besides that, let me stay on this slide for a second. We also wanted to look at reef health, specifically ocean acidification. If the ocean gets more acidic in these areas, the reef will not thrive the way that it has in the past. And that could be extremely bad. So the predictions do not look good right now. I don't have a map for that, but I will show you our model and our predictions. So here on the left, that is reef access. And we did five different, not five, three different scenarios. One being no change, one being a 5% decline after 2050 every decade and the other one being a 20% decline every decade after 2050. So those are those three groupings. And we chose 2050 because we don't think that reef access will decline immediately, but once it does, it will be fairly rapid depending on the slow or rapid decline. Um, and then these different colors are representative of the reef health. So the dark blue is no change. 
the gray is if the recount time by about 15 seconds by 2100, and the light blue is if the recount time by 90%. We will only have 10% of our reads left by 2100, so that is a rapid transition. It's interesting to note that no matter the read access grouping, if you look at the light blue, they're all pretty low for the value we've estimated for 2100. That is because if you don't have a leak, it doesn't matter whether or not you can access it, it's not there. So there is a big difference between if we hopefully, fingers crossed, have like no change in these estimates there, which would leave us with about 1,779 million dollars of um, resurfaced and surface value versus 143 if we use a rapid decline in access and a rapid decline in health. So that is what I have there. This is a table of the total ecosystem service values up until 2100. So it goes from 2021, like I said, calculating to 2100, and then we use a um, discount. I can't remember where. It's a discount percentage to estimate how much that value would be worth in 2100 because a dollar today is not necessarily worth the same as that dollar in 2100. And this is in billions, not like millions for the other one. So here we can see that no change we're getting about 150 million, which we get no change in both versus 94 being the lowest if we see declines in that access time. So both sea level um, rise and ocean acidification do have the potential to reduce the amount of ecosystem service value that we can receive from the Florida Keys Reef, but the reef health has more potential than the reef access, again, because we need the reef to be there in the first place. So my conclusions are that the reef is currently generating about three to four um, billion dollars a year for us, 80% of that being regulating and habitat, the other 20% being provisioning and cultural services. Both sea level and ocean acidification can play a part in the decline of these values in the future. And this is a great foundation for thinking about different kinds of policies and investments that we want to make in the reef and how important that this reef will be both to the residents and to people that want to visit in the future. That is one thing that we accounted for in our models. We looked at the United States Census in order to determine what our population prediction would be for the next. Um, 100 years. We were able to see up to 2050, which is estimated at a, about a 50 per 25 percent increase in population. So we made ours a little higher. It's a 37 percent increase. And we have a special thank you to Dr. Hauka for mentoring me, the Woods Hole Partnership Education Program, and everyone involved in it for making this possible. The Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Marine Policy Center, and the Woods Hole Sea Grant Program. So thank you for your time. Do you have any questions? I think we have time for two questions. Um, hi, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I was just wondering um, what kind of policies do you think should be, should be put in place to preserve the coral reefs? You know, I haven't thought about it too much, but it would definitely be things that would impact both sea level rise and sea health. The main thing that I can think of off the top of my head would be our emissions. If we have more greenhouse gases going into the air, that's going to accelerate both sea level rise because it's getting hotter and also the different chemical cycles that are chemical um, reactions that go into acidifying the ocean. So oh. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, I appreciate uh, your presentation. Um, I just had a question. It's kind of a hypothetical, um, okay. but with a lot of like the technology kind of increasing rapidly, you know, after years, um, I just kind of wondered um, if we're looking in terms of like reef, like maybe reclamation mm -hmm. over time, how would that, how that might affect like our budget as a whole for a lot of those environmental things? I'm not sure. 
Okay. I haven't researched <laughs> too much into the policy implementation part. Mm -hmm. um, this would just be a foundation for the people that are more experienced than me to build on that. So I can't give a recommendation that I'm sure would be plausible. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Thank you so much. So that's two questions. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to talk about my Falmouth Public School collaboration. I have been working with the lovely Christina Wood. She teaches seventh grade science, and we have had so much fun this summer collaborating on what we would like to do for her seventh graders. As we were talking, one thing that we were talking about, I got inspired by a little teaching seminar that we had as a PEP2 student. And one of the things that we had discussed was that it's very hard for teachers to get the right resources, whether it's because they just don't exist, maybe they're not quite right for their classroom, so they need to build them themselves or cut them down. And it takes up a lot of the time in lesson planning to just find the right resources to make those lessons possible. So we were beginning to talk about that and I was like, okay, I'm gonna pump out worksheets for you this summer. I'm not sure what yet, but we're gonna do that. And as we began to talk more about how my project could look in a seventh grade level, I began to talk about all the other marine policy interns who I had met over the summer that I thought their projects were super cool as well. And I was like, oh, we can go this way and we can add some chemistry, we can add some policy, we need the biology and tourism, which is uh, economics and all of these different ideas. And then Christina told me, that's exactly what I'm trying to teach my students, how interdisciplinary not only policy can be, but environmental science in general. So we collaborated along with several of the marine policy interns and we got to interview them for about 15 minutes each. And we asked them different questions such as how they got interested in their field, what their project is on, things that they would want the seventh graders to consider. And then a little um, diagram, either a map, maybe one of the girls did a survey. So she showed her survey um, acceptance form that you have to check off before you can take the survey. And what we're gonna use these for along with putting our faces so that the students know that these are real people doing real science that look hopefully like them. And they can have discussions on if I was to do this project, what kind of information would I need? How would I go about it? And it can be like a discussion week. Another thing that we have currently started to do is work on a day in the life of a field scientist workbook. I love to draw, so I was like, yes, let me draw all the scientists in all the different environments. So we are working on this right now. I'm not quite sure all of the content that we will include, but I'm sure it will include different areas that the scientists go to, what a typical day looks like, maybe what kind of education you need and so on. But I think it'll be really fun for the seventh graders to see different scientists on a boat, climbing up a mountain with a rock hammer or getting in the water with the waders. So those are my contributions so far. And thank you again. <laughs> All right, this has been really fun. So I thought that we are at our last presentation for today. Last presentation is from Tiffany Winholt. And her presentation is Analyzing Terrestrial Carbon Flux Distribution Across the Arctic. Welcome, Tiffany. Hello everyone, my name is Tiffany Windholt and I'm going to be a senior at Oklahoma State University. Um, last summer I was a PEP student and I'm really glad to be back this summer as a PEP2 researcher. So the project I worked on was analyzing terrestrial carbon flux site distribution across the Arctic. And my mentor was Anna Virkula of the Woodwell Climate Research Center. So there are two important things to keep in mind as I go through this presentation. And that is one, the Arctic is warming two to three times faster than the global average. And two, the tundra and boreal biomes are large carbon reservoirs. So to put into perspective how much carbon they store, the boreal biome stores roughly two thirds of all carbon found in forests. 
and this is found both in the trees and in their soil. Um, on the other hand, in the tundra, due to the lack of trees, um, relatively little carbon is stored in the plant biomass, so a lot of the carbon stored here is found in permafrost. And permafrost stores two times as much carbon as the atmosphere and three times the amount, sorry, three times the amount of carbon as all forests on Earth. Another thing to keep in mind is both of these biomes are undergoing change as a result of climate change. So for example, the boreal biome, um, which is this map up here, um, it is experiencing an increase in wildfires and the tundra, um, the bottom map, is experiencing increases in permafrost loss. Uh, both of these changes are being accelerated by feedback loops and ultimately these changes can change the overall carbon balance in these areas um, and their carbon fluxes. So, um, so, yeah. Okay, so the problem that I'm trying to solve is, well, part of my project included a literature review. And upon doing this review, I found three main things that are often commented on by researchers who are currently studying Arctic carbon fluxes. And that is more sites are needed overall, uh, more sampling sites. The extreme conditions, so the uppermost or lowermost uh, values of the conditions, uh, those are undersampled, so more sites are needed there, as well as longer measurement periods are needed. So a lot of studies are done during the summer months, which is understandable due to the lack of accessibility during the winter months. However, in order to put a more clear picture together of the overall Arctic carbon balance, more year-round sampling is needed. So um, this map just shows all the countries that um, currently have a site location in them. Um, just to give you an idea of when I start talking about the distribution, where I'm talking about. And my goal of the project is to review the overall site distribution, locate some of these areas with extreme values, and be able to recommend a few sites, a few site locations uh, that I would suggest at least looking into maybe installing a new site. So for my materials and materials and methods, I worked with many files throughout this project. So I'll tell you a little bit more about each of them now. So the most important file was the Flux database. And this is where all the information for each site came from. And this file was created as a collaboration between Woodwell and many researchers who um, offered information about the, each Flux site um, from their past articles or past work in general. So this file contains information like the coordinates, um, the season and the year the flux was measured, as well as uh, what method it was used or what method sampled it. So either eddy covariance towers or chambers. Um, and then for my climate data, that came from the 1989 to 2019 period from the Terra Climate, Terra climate product with the spatial resolution of four kilometers as well as my soil organic carbon roster file came uh, produced as part of a soil grids effort. The permafrost shape file was sourced from the National Snow and Ice Data Center, and the biome shape file was sourced from the Resolve Ecoregions app. As for my methods, I used R and ArcGIS Pro to explore the data and visualize um, the distribution of the sites. I did do some data analysis in R, however, um, the main focus of my project was just exploring the best way to visualize and uh, make my conclusions based off that. So before I get into the distribution of the sites, I wanted to show you two field sampling methods that are often used so you kind of get an idea of what's actually happening at each of these sites. So the device on the left, that is the chamber method, and it is in enclosed device that collects emissions from an isolated surface area. And this operates at spatial scales of about one square meter. On the right is the eddy covariance method. And this is a tower that um, measures the transport of the vertical transport of gases from the ecosystems to the atmosphere and vice versa. And this operates at spatial scales of over one square kilometer. So first, I want to show you the site distribution across the boreal and tundra biomes. Um, there are currently 212 CO2 flux sites across the Arctic with 62 sites currently active. 97 of these are found in the boreal and 115 are found in the tundra. 
And then looking at this map, this geographically areas that appear to be well sampled are Northern Europe here, South Central Canada, and Alaska. On the other hand, areas that do not appear to be as well sampled are areas like Northern and Eastern Canada, as well as much of Russia remains in this notation. Next, um, I looked at the site distribution across temperature and precipitation conditions. So the map on the left is the uh, sites across the uh, temperature conditions with the red indicating warmer temperatures and the blue indicating colder temperatures. So looking at this, you can see some of the really cold regions such as Northern Canada and um, Eastern Siberia. They do not appear to be well sampled um, as well as European Russia here with um, really warm temperatures also does not appear to be well sampled. On the right, that is the map of the precipitation conditions. So looking at the dark blue, uh, that represents the areas with increased precipitation amounts. So in eastern Canada right here, as well as southern Norway, uh, those areas do not appear to be well sampled. And then areas with lower amounts of precipitation, such as northern Canada and eastern Siberia, also does not appear to be very well sampled. So um, kind of getting a look at the extremes really are understood. So this chart is just another way of visualizing the site distribution across precipitation and temperature conditions. So to create this, I took a random sample of each of the uh, climate rosters and I combined them, which created the blue pixels in the background. So the dark blue indicates areas of low frequent combined conditions, and the lighter blue pixels in the center represent uh, more like higher frequent combined conditions between the two variables. Then the sites are plotted on top of the condition in which they're found. So by looking at this, you can see that the overall site distribution does fall in areas with high frequent um, combined conditions, which is a good thing because those are the most frequent conditions. However, this chart, along with the two maps uh, previously, they really highlight that the extremes and the climate conditions are lacking. So the next two variables I looked at was the site distribution across permafrost zones and soil organic carbon conditions. So the map on the left is the sites and permafrost zones with the pink, the center pink color being the continuous zone and going outward is um, discontinuous, sporadic, and isolated. Um, so each of these different zones are classified by how much permafrost is under the surface. So continuous has the most, and then it increasingly gets less and less as you go out. Currently, there are 89 sites in the continuous zone, 45 in discontinuous, 19 in sporadic, and 11 in isolated. So a thing to know about this map is the non-continuous zones, or the last three basically, they are experiencing some of the most rapid permafrost thaw, yet they have the least amount of sites currently. And moving on to the soil organic carbon map uh, on the right, I really like this map because of how clearly you can see where the extremes are. So for example, here in the Hudson Bay lowland region in Canada, as well as Western Siberia, you can see high amounts of soil organic carbon, and again, both of these regions appear to be undersampled. So this is just another way to visualize the unsampled extreme conditions. So to create this map, I um, extracted the roster data to the site locations, and I found the minimum and maximum value of the condition that is currently sampled by a site, and then um, in the roster for each of these variables, I set the values between the, minim the minimum and maximum to be NA or not available. So all that you're seeing is the values above the maximum and below the minimum. So uh, they're the extremes that are currently unsampled by the current distribution of sites. And this map is just helpful in visualizing the areas that we've kind of already talked about, such as the high soil organic carbon conditions, here in Canada and over here in Western Siberia, as well as um, the really cold temperatures in Northern Canada in this area and high precipitation amounts in Southern Norway down here. So 
So this map is just of the current distribution in the black circles, as well as uh, locations where I would recommend at least looking into maybe implementing a site here um, in the green triangles. Um, so my recommendation comes from the extremes, trying to locate some of the extremes and target these areas, as well as just trying to expand the distribution geographically. And then to wrap up my presentation, I just want to conclude with a few things that I want you to remember, such as the Arctic is warming disproportionately to the rest of the world, and um, the boreal and tundra biomes are undergoing a lot of change right now, and these changes could impact the fluxes. So in order to get a better understanding of the current state of the Arctic carbon balance, as well as learning how it's changing um, with climate change, uh, more sites are needed in order to get a better understanding. And then um, this map is just kind of highlighting just in the countries, another view at the map I just showed you previously. Um, so you can see that I suggested sites, yeah, in Southern Norway, across Russia, and in Canada. Okay, and those are my references. Hi, Tiffany, that was really, really, really good. Um, my only question I had was, I noticed that a lot of um, the sites weren't in like Eastern Russia and Siberia. Is that, do you think for like political reasons and like access reasons or more just like people just have yet to go out there? I think a lot of it has to do with the lack of accessibility. So okay. the Arctic is, has very remote regions with not even roads sometimes. So it's, I think it's just more about the lack of accessibility to these areas currently. Okay. Thank you so much. Good job again. Hello. Um, so I had a question. I was wondering what you expect to find in carbon fluxes in these extremes, in the extreme, you know, cold temperatures, wet temperatures, and very dry temperatures, hot temperatures. Oh, that's a good question. So in doing the literature review, I found some things that were really interesting. So for example, when there's like a lot of snow on the ground, sometimes the flux can, or the emissions can be delayed because it actually gets trapped in the snow and then is actually released later um, as the snow melts. So that would be a good, that's a good question. I'd like to explore it more. I guess I don't have too good of an answer about um, exactly what happens, but. Thank you. That was a really interesting project. Thanks for sharing. Um, my question is similar. I guess it was look is whether you'd looked at uh, temperature crossed with precipitation. So like hot, dry, and cold, wet looked like they were more frequent, but not sampled at all. Yes. Okay. Some of the areas that um, I highlighted in the temperature maps kind of overlapped with the areas in the precipitation map. So like Northern Canada was really dry and cold. Eastern Siberia was really dry and cold. So, um, wait, sorry, can you repeat? Yeah. Conditions, uh, like temperature on the X and precipitation yeah. on the Y, yeah, that one. So like the cold and wet and hot and dry are undersampled. Like if you look at the cross right. as opposed to just individually to see where it is. Right, yeah. Sorry. Oh, can would you, could, would have, yeah, but, but, uh, I don't know. Would you look at that in the future or is that something that? Yeah, that is definitely something to keep in mind and as we go forward with the future research. Um, yeah, looking at like, cause just from this, you can see that the, the frequent conditions are well sampled. But like you said, some of the areas where it's really cold or really wet or versus really dry, those are undersampled. So I think that is something we're gonna keep in mind as we go forward. Okay. Okay, so next I wanted to tell you about the work that I did um, with Chris Brothers, a Falmouth public school teacher. 
Um, I'm going to see if I can actually pull it up on the web. Okay, sorry about that. So I was hoping to actually pull it up on the web and show you, but these screenshots will do. So I had already created a story map about the research that I had been doing. But upon talking with Chris about it, we thought it would be a really good idea to make, uh, kind of adapt it and make it a more interactive experience for students. So basically, the flow of it is they open the story map, and there's this introduction, as well as um, a section about the carbon cycle, and then the underlined first two words, that is a link to a YouTube video. So a lot of these sections that I wrote, um, they have external links that the students can click on to kind of get a better understanding of the details in the story. And I've got sections on the boreal biome, the tundra, the carbon flux monitoring. So I'm kind of explaining the two different methods. And um, each, well, almost after each section, there is a question in red at the very bottom where I, I asked them a question about what they just went over. Um, and also the QR code here, if you scan it with your phone, like open your camera and point it at it and then click the link, you can, you can pull it up. So one part about the story map that we wanted to do was actually make the map interactive for the students so that they can get an experience um, or a mapping experience um, working with a program such as GIS without having to deal with like worrying about uh, the different files and trying to import them. And with limited time, we created this way. And they can actually click through each of the layers um, right here. And I have written questions for them to practice their map interpretation skills and kind of work their way through the story map, reading, uh, watching videos, and then getting to interact with these maps and answer the questions. I'm going to go ahead and say I think those presentations deserve another round of applause. That goes <laughs> those were really impressive, you guys. I'm really excited to see them. Uh, working with PEP2 this year has been really awesome. It's been very different than working with the PEP students because the PEP students take a class. It's a lot more hands-on. And PEP2, they were very much researchers on their own. So all of this was like my first time seeing it and definitely really exciting. I think you guys did a wonderful job. Uh, before we wrap up, I wanna make sure I say a few more thank yous. Again, thank you to the Woods Hole Sea Grant for providing the funding. We had talked about doing a PEP2 for years and uh, just hadn't gotten to it yet. And so when this call came out at Sea Grant last year, we decided this was time to take that first step. So thank you for the pilot money and anybody here watching who thinks that this should continue we will be looking for more money next year. <laughs> uh, thank you to all the PEP partners, of course, the Education Association, Marine Biological Laboratory, NOAA Northeast Fisheries Science Center, the MBL. Special thank you again to Woodwell, again, for hosting us today um, and for the additional funding to bring an additional student uh, to the HUI, HUI in general, specifically the HUI Marine Policy Center for giving us, again, more money to bring in someone else. And a thank you to the mentors. We literally could not do any research projects without you. So thank you to all the mentors. And a very special thank you to our Falmouth Public School teachers. So when we first put this collaboration together, um, I said, we wanna get some teachers and we wanna do something. And they said, great, what are we doing? And I said, I don't know yet. And they go, oh, okay, so what grade levels are we gonna work with? And we said, we don't know yet. And they were very excited and jumped right in and said, 
that this is something we want to do, something we want to partner with. And I know that especially this last year has been a difficult one, a challenging one. And so for you guys to step up and say, we want to do this and really put in the time to work with these researchers has been really amazing. And so I want to say a special thank you to you all who are here and those of you who are listening. Um, lastly, again, thanks to Lindsay Scott for helping set this up today. And don't forget that on Tuesday, we have our PEP symposium at Redfield starting at 930 going until 2 p.m. So we hope that you all can join us either in person or watch us via Zoom. So thank you again for being here today. And we will head back to SBA for a barbecue. <laughs>